Good afternoon, dear friends. The government announced weakening quarantine for churches. So how does church come out of quarantine? How does church live? What are special rituals and meaning for celebration of the day of Ascension, the day of Pentecost, or the day of Trinity? I'm, my name is Vasil Ostri, and I'd like to introduce priests of Erpin, who are members of our discussion today. First, uh, Father Andri uh, from Orthodox Church of uh, St. Nicholas, uh, Miracle Workers, then Miroslav Latinik from Greek Catholic uh, Parish of uh, the Birth of uh, Virgin Mary, Father Tadeusz from Roman Catholic Parish of St. Teresa, and Pastor Mikola Romaniuk. So, Andrei, please tell us about uh, the new permits, uh, new norms for the churches to meet. The first norm is that in any facility, you can have one person per uh, four square meters, whether inside or outside. We had to re-measure. Uh, Before that, we had rule of 10 meters, but now... Um, that's hundred. Uh, um, uh, that would be one point um, seven meters from me. But now it's from me to Father Tadeusz. If everything is well in the government with mathematics, that's nice. That's good news. And this Sunday, for celebration of the Day of Trinity, and then on Saturday the day of uh, remembrance for the dead, we will have church services, but everyone will have to wear a mask. Tell us, please, do people attend church? The quarantine is weakened, but Father Tadej, is it additional signal and people started to come to church more actively? Yes, you can say that from the moment when the government announced weakening of the quarantine, our church uh, attendance has increased for the time of um, our liturgy. We live according to the new calendar, Gregorian calendar. So we already had celebrated uh, the day of Trinity or day of Pentecost, as we call it. So last Sunday, we actually had many people and I really uh, enjoyed it. Mikola, tell us about your uh, plan Do you have a plan of getting out of quarantine? Yes, European Bible Church started getting out of quarantine through small group Bible studies. Our church is mainly built out of small groups, and um, we are used to have three worship services, but uh, the new rules would not allow even for that uh, because we have too many people. We have more than 50 small groups in our church, Some have not survived the quarantine, but new groups have been created. So for the Day of Trinity, we'll still have online service. And until now, that was online, but our worship service is happening in small groups that are meeting live in person. And um, there will be also beginning uh, the second um Uh, Sunday, uh, we'll have uh, uh, some people meeting in the church, some on the uh, outside, and then uh, we'll um, have uh, this uh, meeting at 9, 11, and uh, 1. Father uh, Miroslav, how did um, you come out of quarantine? Well, the government has changed rules, and we started with... 10 people inside the church, but our territory is large and people could stand around, but they had to wear masks. So anyone who would come to Holy Communion during the worship service, one priest would offer uh, the communion and other priest would disinfect the spoon as uh, we did. But our church uh, members who wanted to come inside, we asked people to does in fact people people's hands, so nobody would accuse a church of spreading the virus. But 
even at the time of quarantine, people would come to church. Little by little, even after celebration of Easter, people would come, 10, 15 at a time. On the outside, inside, we had three worship liturgy, one at 8.30, second at 10 online, and another at 5 o'clock in the evening to have more spread in time so anyone could, could come. Also, we had confession. We would have confession on the out, outside, and priests would wear masks. There would be distance. Now the quarantine is weekend, and person can stand one from the other uh, in one and a half meters. So after the weakening quarantine, people started coming back to temples, not just to ours, to any temple in our town. So we expect for the day of Trinity, there will be more people. This uh, past Sunday at Second Liturgy, we had up to 40 people. That's small worship service uh, during quarantine and as we get out of it. In this situation, I'm concerned that feelings are mixed for many people. Some people deny everything that's happening and they want to have things as they had before. Others are overly cautious. And I think there is certain tension between people. And as a church... We need to teach people to get closer to each other, but not to hurt each other, because still in European, as I read statistics, we have 75 people sick with COVID-19. So we need to be careful, but still look to have unity in the church. This question, does infection or overly over uh, um, care um, for disease or the careless issue. Can we call this question uh, as freedom? It's about faith of your neighbor, like Apostle Paul taught in uh, Corinthians about the meat sacrifice to idols. Is it the place to serve um, each other and to be merciful to each other. Yes, you can see analogy there, and there is fear in people. A couple days ago, I had a meeting with that interesting person, and he was at a distance with me. I was outside, and he wore a mask. People at this time have fear, and I think we need to help people overcome that fear because we are with the Lord. We should not be afraid whether we get out of quarantine in the future, we already have gotten out of quarantine. We should be bold and uh, we should not be scared at homes. It's like in 20th century or in 1st century, Christians were underground, but we are getting out of this quarantine. Our parish uh, participated in uh, this pilgrimage uh, uh, to Vizhorod. Usually we would uh, come physically from uh, uh, the main temple, but we had it online and people prayed for healing, for um, stop uh, for this pandemic, for uh, the peace and for the nation. There is fear that we need to overcome and we'll need to, to battle it because really there are people who were not afraid at this time of hard quarantine they were not afraid to come to worship service and during the day our temple was open people could come but there were people who would not come at all and still they're not coming so they're calling they're asking things uh, to do outside the church. And this is fear we need to overcome. This fear will remain, I think. The time should pass, I think. And I think this fear will be overcome when there will be vaccine. Maybe in a year or two, we don't know when, but we need to learn how to live with that virus. It's like... Uh, uh, 
rowing on waves, that sometimes waves go up, sometimes down, but we are learning, we are learning to do online broadcast because when people have online broadcast, we are lazy. We don't want to come. Just uh, have some coffee, sit at sofa, watch and pray. So after Trinity, we would like to stop uh, broadcast. But if you are watching online, you still need to be like in church. Stand up, light the candle, and pray. But online, this prayer is a distance, it's different. I think quarantine taught us, and the whole situation with the virus taught us, to consider reality of fear. It, of course, touches personal faith, personal understanding, but it also changes the preaching. I'm convinced that we are the ministers of God, and we need to teach people to trust God more as we are um, taking precautions. We cannot protect 100%, and all precautions cannot take away fear. So we need to teach people to confront the fear. Christians have all the tools. Holy Spirit, faith in triune God, Holy Scripture, Bible text, Psalms of David. We need to teach people to care for their own soul, to protect their own soul. I'd like to add about our broadcast. And as we talked with Father Andre, I shared that in Poland, they opened uh, churches fully. You can come as much as you want, of course, um, with all uh, the protection gear, and people don't want to come. They are used now to being able to watch. This is the next problem. That's the next problem, fear, but also that it's more pleasurable for them to watch. Think, watching marriage of your friends online and celebrating with them online or to be at the event physically. I think there is a huge difference. You can watch from afar. You can celebrate. Technology allows you, but your participation is uh, minimal. You can write a comment, but that's it. Same thing with the church. Technology allows. It's good. You can watch the online ministry, uh, online service, but how can person be involved in the process? Very minimally. We can notice this thing. In quarantine, we need to, to watch all the rules, so be careful. It's quarantine, although weekend, and we need, we need to, to tell people, sons and daughters of the church, come back to the home of your heavenly father. In addition to fear, we also do this thing that those people who um, have gone through disease and recovered, we keep distance from them, they become pariahs. And we should not do that. Because as we've seen in the west of Ukraine, people who worked in hospitals noticed that uh, if someone got sick, their family uh, was pariah in um, a village or in town. Um, in Erpin, um, we still have this problem in addition to fear, there is um, con considering this person as um, second class. It's not problem of Western Ukraine, it's problem of the whole world. We have noticed uh, in Poland the same example. When doctors uh, uh, who work with um, patients of COVID are um, pariahs, there is one person who got sick. He was in the village. And people started to stay away from my parents in the village. We have not contacted them. And uh, now they don't want to talk to my parents because uh, they might be carriers. But each of us is carrier of sin disease. You see, people do not see transfer of sins. People do not die. Well, actually, they die from sin and much more, unfortunately. 
we look at conclusions of our quarantine. There is fear that we need to live with and we need to teach people how to battle it. What other conclusions can we make? People are lazy or they don't want to come to church because of fear they are comfortable watching online. Can there be other conclusions of quarantine the church can make? It seems to me that there is a big problem, economical problem, survival problem, I think. This problem is coming and church needs to respond. The next thing, the next question that we need to ask and we need to help people resolve that issue. Many people, look, they have come back from the West, from uh, their place of employment, and they cannot go back. Their savings are already spent. We had several examples. When a person came to me and said, help me, please, because I cannot make my ends meet. So we need to be careful with economic situation of people. We need to help them. Has quarantine changed approach to church tradition, church rituals? You already said about spoons that are disinfected, hands that are disinfected. Something else? Maybe something else will change. Maybe you would go to some other traditions. Um, uh, I'd like to say something. It's not just spoons. Many of our Orthodox uh, people love to kiss um, icons, or used to. Now I see people do not do that. They don't kiss the Bible that we have at the altar in the morning service. People need to kiss the gospel. They show, make a show of an action, but they don't actually touch with their lips this is not a worship of an object. That's worship of a creator, of course. But I see that it's moving to different um, reverence. From materialistic reverence to spiritual, that's good. I think some churches, some communities, I think, um, have changed. Uh, but we are still uh, um, offering communion with a spoon. Um, but the first Christians were giving uh, this communion into hand, not using the spoon. For us, uh, this was not a tradition. Some people have it. For the time of quarantine, our uh, bishop allowed to, uh, uh, to have this communion given to hand. But there is uh, the situation. And during quarantine, we understood the meaning of the small church, small group Bible study. And we will need to develop these small worship forms. And as conclusion of quarantine, we want to help believers of our community to be joined to small group Bible st study and the communion the next um, Sunday on Trinity will be happening in a small group Bible studies. And we would like for the future for everyone to be associating themselves to a small group Bible st study. Of course, we are part of a larger European Bible church, but also a small group, small church that will survive quarantine or any turmoil. So that's preparation for the future. We don't know what it will be. We had very interesting theological battles in Orthodox Internet. Can a person, for example, not being in the church building, take a piece of bread and wine? Can the priest bless this communion long distance? The priest serves liturgy, but is the... Bread and wine sanctified through broadcast. And that was a huge debate. There are different, uh, two different groups. In 2005, I remember, or 2004, when I was at seminary at the first year, the professor showed online church. That's a website. Person can click things. There is prayer, communion, 
You can say the prayer. And that was a long time ago. And that seemed very wild at that time. Please. Let's start talking about celebrations, evangelical events, ascension. What do we celebrate? What's this gospel event where it's written? Let's start with this event. What is it and what does church celebrate? Mikola, please. The ascension day, it's not the earliest uh, celebration, but it relates to the life of Jesus Christ. It's the last thing that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. After ascension on the fourth, after resurrection on the 40th day, he ascended. Matthew uh, portrayed Jesus' words, I like the Acts chapter 1, when Luke uh, quite brightly describes this last meeting, gathering of disciples Jesus is telling his disciples that he is going back and he will send the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, disciples thought, oh, the kingdom will be renewed. And he said, no, you don't need to know the terms. But he leaves them the promise. The Holy Spirit will come down and you will become my witnesses. And he takes them to the mountain and right uh, uh, there in front of them. He ascends to the heavens and disciples uh, were amazed watching him. Two angels appeared and they said, uh, men, why you are watching? Go back to your real life. And first disciples didn't uh, uh, see Jesus, but they had to live by his word. They had to rely on his promises. And this Sunday and on Sunday, we will recall uh, this and my conclusion is that Christians, disciples now need to reveal Jesus to all the people. Jesus is not among us. He ascended, but he said, you will be my witnesses. So each Christian uh, represents Jesus Christ here on earth. Uh, during this holiday, ascension, um, Disciples remained disciples. Jesus Christ ascended and they became apostles, which means they preached the, about the one whom they saw, who did miracles, and they have now to repeat it all. And the Holy Spirit who will come down on them, in 10 days he will give them a spe special force, special power. Before that they were shy, they were cowards, they were afraid. And when they were in the special, uh, they received this facility. Apostle Peter, he was outrageous. Uh, he was uh, very uh, brave. And God gave them this power of the Holy Spirit. Liturgical texts will tell us about this, that they will be expecting the Holy Spirit. Acts will be telling us, uh, stay in Jerusalem. Uh, stay them. Jesus will tell them these words. I have a question. We know about ascension and in Acts in first chapter, it uh, talks about ascension. What about Matthew last chapter? The same events are being described there. Let's focus our attention on Matthew 28. If you uh, don't mind, I will open uh, 28, Matthew 28 verse 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We see that some disciples bowed down and worshipped him, but some were doubtful. What does it mean? So... Uh, these were disciples, for sure. These were people who were with Jesus. They saw him. I think we, um, it talks about not just uh, about those 12 disciples who saw Jesus Christ. Uh, we know about Judah who uh, committed suicide, even though he could have repented like Peter, but he has made his, wrong, his choice 
But I think uh, these were not only 11 disciples over there. There is information from the scriptures that there were 500 people who saw him. And this was not the uh, crowd's craziness. No, these were real witnesses like Thomas, Apostle Thomas. And we remember the next week after Easter, one of 12, they, uh, he doubted. He wanted to touch uh, the rib, the hands of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ had the scope, uh, such a big scope that those who were close to him, 12 of them, then there was a circle of 70 and then 100 people and 500 people. Apostle Paul talks about it in the Corinthians. Uh, but among these 70, there were people for whom it was quite difficult to grasp this information about Jesus Christ, and they needed time. This litur liturgical text uh, about ascension, yes, he has taken the words from gospel, and other part uh, was taken from the uh, forefathers of 8th and 9th century. Angels told uh, why you stand here and watch uh, the sky? This same Father, the same Christ who ascended to the Father, he will come back, serve him in, san uh, san uh, in holiness and righteousness. Actually, this event, this ascension event, it is constant. It's uh, the same in the church and among people. And our Roman Catholic Church, it uh, started concentrating its attention on a uh, part of Jesus Christ. Uh, some people call it the body, Jesus Christ as a man. When Jesus Christ goes up to heaven, he takes our human body with himself. And here we want to go back to the premier plan of uh, God the Father when he said, let's create the human being which will be uh, very, uh, which would carry the image of God. So we refer to the story of S uh, Thomas but as we look at the teaching of Jesus Christ, he's talking about bread. He will give you the life eternal. And he says, this is my body. But many people became doubtful. So this is a, a weakness that some people have. It's the weakness of doubt, being doubtful. It's a very characteristic it very um, uh, it's a feature that we all have only when there is faith there is a doubt those who never trusted he never probably uh, uh, doubted and if the person didn't really doubt he probably never trusted never believed for sure even though it's not very good maybe but uh, yeah, these doubts they test our faith I also wanted to say that when we celebrate Ascension Day, when closest people who lived during the times of Jesus Christ, they had doubts, uh, what can uh, we uh, say about a modern person? Um, it's a special gift. These doubts, these doubts, they... It's normal to have doubts. I still have a thought. Where is the body of Jesus Christ? He ascended. Where is the body physically? It uh, didn't evaporate anywhere. What Pastor McCullough said, this is, a, this is very interesting. Why? Because really the person who feels something that he doesn't understand uh, anything or he doubts in something, when he takes it seriously and he starts searching for an answer, then 
this progress appears, the development. But when the person gives up and puts down his hands, then it's uh, a skept skepsis appears, skeptical reactions. We can think of the example of Abraham, who was uh, bold and stable, and uh, God told him, you need to sacrifice your son. He trusted him. And then God took care of the situation. He sent the lamb. Let's remember Apostle Peter and Jesus said, walk on the water. He walked and doubted, and then he started drowning. When Jesus told him, you will uh, uh, reject me uh, when you hear the rooster, uh, but then when he did it, he recalled the words of Jesus. Did the person, uh, modern person change since the times of Jesus Christ? No, didn't change a bit. Still scared, frightened, the cruelest creature of God is a person and the best creation of God, the most beautiful creation of God is the person. I think as we talk about ascension, we mention doubts because Jesus who physically was uh, uh, here on earth uh, throughout uh, three years, he uh, disappears. So the topic of doubts becomes very acute. For me, the topic of ascension is associated more with the mission. He goes further, he goes to the Father, and he says, you are my witnesses. And ascension, it's the holiday that reminds us that Christians received God, Son, uh, the mission, the task. Actually, in Lutheran Church in Germany, uh, it's actually a very special day. It's a state holiday. They celebrate Ascension Day. And many Lutherans and many evangelicals, they make tr uh, Ascension uh, as a day of mission. They have uh, related this day with the day of missions. They actually added the day of Father to the same day. Very rational. I want to add here, uh, as we talk about ascension, uh, actually our Greek Catholic Church has the decade of uh, missiology. Uh, why? Because our spirit of uh, mission-minded uh, uh, philosophy, it has uh, disappeared somewhere. So we're trying to remind people. We have the slogan, go, teach, baptize all nations. Sometimes we uh, feel like um, we don't talk enough about this, uh, uh, this topic. I think quarantine helped us realize that in these... Uh, um, uh, conditions, we need to think about new methods, new formats of uh, mission-minded uh, idea. So we talked about ascension, let's talk about another holiday, Pentecost. What is it? Uh, what is the main uh, evangelical event that stands behind this uh, holiday? Actually, it's the analogy from the Old Testament and in two books, it's uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they recall Pentecost, it's the newest name. At first, it was called differently. I think it was called uh, uh, 49 days after uh, the... Tool has cut the wheat fields. They celebrated this day as a Thanksgiving day. Thanksgiving to God. After the exodus from Egypt, uh, this is when the day Pentecost has appeared. When for the first time in the desert they didn't have any harvest, but they had these memories and they recall the law that Moses has uh, acquired on the mountain uh, Zion. We won't say the word Zion because we don't know exactly where it was. But this name was uh, 
accurate during the days of Jesus Christ and the Pentecost when they celebrated uh, in Jerusalem, when they get together for the Easter and the Holy Spirit has descended and uh, it was there in the shape of fire, flames over their heads and they received the special gifts which they needed to preach. And as it was uh, mentioned before today, people who were so frightened, who saw the death of their master, now they turned into the teachers and apostles. So this, was, this is the date of birthday of the church. And they also say that this is the day of priesthood because priesthood is a mystery in uh, Orthodox Church and in Catholic Church as well, I think. Roman Catholic and Greek Catholic Church. So this is our professional holiday. So speaking about our Roman Catholic Church, I think it's the same with Greek Catholics and uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, we have a special prayer that is called Novena. Uh, uh, and this year, in a special way, I focused on how important it is for us to have this prayer during the time of pandemic. Yeah, because the fact that we can meet and when Holy Spirit descended on apostles, on disciples, they come out and they start preaching. They become witnesses. They preach and they uh, witness, witnessing. They realize this mission. Apostles who saw there, who were there, after uh, ascension of their teacher, they were like in a quarantine before the Pentecost. And it's the same situation as the church is nowadays. We are, the church is in quarantine. It's uh, it, Orthodox, Protestant churches, uh, Greek Catholic churches, and quarantine is being weakened up, but uh, for the... Uh, Pentecost, we can come out and we can physically come to church and not be afraid. But we need to keep up the rules of quarantine. I, I reread this uh, uh, chapter 2 of Acts of Apostles that describes uh, this story when uh, fire flames um, came on disciples and it also is written that... Uh, uh, the wind was heard. And uh, I also think about uh, John, um, Gospel of John, chapter 3, when um, uh, Jesus talked about illustration of wind. Holy Spirit is um, illustrated by wind. You cannot see the wind, but you can see the actions of wind. You can see dust coming up, uh, leaves flying. Uh, the strong wind can break trees not just shake them or pick up something heavy so when you can hear the wind and uh, you can um, see the actions of wind but you cannot see the wind itself say same way you can see the action of the holy spirit not just apostles but also 120 people including ladies and a mother of jesus mary they received power they received special gift and uh, not uh, being not learning foreign languages they spoken in foreign languages to everyone who came to Jerusalem from all parts of the world and these unlearned uh, disciples now preach peter preaches in a week he would heal the sick the community is built church is built many people believe in christ as a result of people uh, 
Peter's sermon and they're baptized. So the Spirit shows himself in power. The work of God, the Spirit, is revived the church. That's why we call it birthday of the church. The power of the Spirit is magnet of the church. That's uh, the illustration I like. If a person has the Holy Spirit in their heart, then they seek community. We are asking question whether people will come back from quarantine or not. Well, those who have the Holy Spirit, they will be pulled into community of Christians because community of Christians are united by the power of Holy Spirit around Jesus. What's theological meaning of this event? There is another interesting theological aspect. All right. Um, I reflected in singing called conduct. In um, this conduct singing, there is a statement that when people built the Tower of Babel, Lord divided them. They stopped understanding each other. That's how many languages appeared. But here we see reverse action. People start to understand each other again. They understand these Jewish fishermen or tax collector. The Holy Spirit unites people again. These are two important aspects. But also in Trapar singing, at our liturgy, we have this statement, Blessed are you, Christ our Lord. And you are saving people through the Holy Spirit. You love people, so we praise you. This is not just a new trick for excitement, but that's to go throughout the universe, throughout the planet, to preach the word, starting with Roman Empire and then beyond. This is a gift of apostleship, and that's how the gospel reached us as well, this way. Right. What's the tradition of celebrating this Trinity Day, Day of Pentecost? Or may uh, I'd like to add something about theological meaning, because we concluded this theological part uh, very fast. The coming of the Holy Spirit is of extreme importance, cannot be neglected. Without coming of the Holy Spirit, there is no church, there is no congregation, there is no Christian life without Holy Spirit. We know sects of Stoics or uh, uh, Neoplatonism in Greek um, 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 philosophy. They try to live morally. Some people live immorally, but there are people who tr strive to live like Christians, but they can't. The Holy Spirit brings a love gift, and Apostle Paul says that, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and also peace, and also righteousness, faith. So discipline, the Holy Spirit, causes us to love God, to love neighbors, forgive neighbors, to be reserved. Holy Spirit forms Christian, revives us to new life, and brings fruit, but also Transforming our lives, he makes our fruit remain. You cannot overestimate the meaning of the Holy Spirit. There are many traditions, but it's important. Uh, it is important to go back to Passover event. The Passover event is not finished by resurrection of Jesus when he went up to heaven. The resurrection event is complemented or completed with coming of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism and people that have come to the church, they're all before our eyes. We understand that we have received the first gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially in sacrament of baptism, he came to us. And then what we do with that, how we live with him. 
Are we really the witnesses of Jesus? Do we proclaim the gospel or we just follow tradition? We need to be baptized and that's it. That's the important part of our celebration. This um, sacrament of uh, anointing with myrrh. This is done in understanding that God is anointing us with the Holy Spirit and we go through uh, this um, sacrament of praying to the King of Heavens. This is a special prayer that we do not pronounce these 10 days. And um, uh, this prayer um, from Kusmana um in 8th century says that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit in day Pentecost. And the first service in, in the evening, evening liturgy, when priest kneels and um, pronounces this prayer, the King of Heaven, the evening, when the Holy Spirit comes, we read prayers on our knees to give honor to the Holy Spirit as he deserves. And we retell the story of the Holy Spirit coming. Serafim Sarovsky, a well-known Orthodox saint, when his disciple asked him, Matavilov, what's the purpose of Christian life? Serafim responded, that's acquiring the Holy Spirit. Acquiring the Holy Spirit. And also, Serafim talked about salvation when they are acquiring the Holy Spirit, then thousands of people will saved around. As they look at the example of this person, we can see the transformation of this person's life because you cannot just change on your whim. It's very hard. A famous um, Baptist theologian of last century, Charles Reiser, said that Christian maturity is life in obedience to the Holy Spirit, obedience to the Holy Spirit defines the scope of your Christian life. In the uh, uh, epistle of Peter, we read that the church, every Christian, is royal priesthood. Without Holy Spirit, we cannot be priests to this world. As people of God, we stand before God for our uh, human people, we stand also before um, non-believers in place of God to tell people about mercy and love of God. And this is done by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting in Ephesians, it says, don't uh, be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you gave quotes of famous people. And I thought of this favorite quote of about the Holy Spirit uh, by Dwight Moody. We are... Um, vessels with holes. We cannot hold the water, but uh, we need to be under the current of living water of the Holy Spirit. And this is not one-time event of being filled. It's constant search, seeking God, seeking His filling. We have some questions in chat on this topic. Could you please respond to the question, who can uh, curse the Holy Spirit and how this is happening? Jesus spoke about two sins. There is about the sin that is never forgiven uh, this um, age or the next, and that's curse against the Holy Spirit. The interpretation is that when person sees visual pre uh, evidence of the presence of God and still they deny God, the Catholic Church is talking about this stoning of uh, human soul, human soul turning into stone. In Protestant understanding, uh, there are two views. You could sin uh, this um, sin at the time of Jesus. He, you see Jesus. He's fulfilling prophecies. He is doing things only Messiah could do. You see the actions of Messiah and only God could do. Like Nicodemus said, only 
Uh, God could do what you're doing and still denying, denying that this is God's work. That's uh, disrespect to the Holy Spirit. That's one view. But the other view is when person touched the grace of God, survived or tasted actually how good God is and still denies God to extend that Jesus said, it's like when uh, uh, one demon is cast out and the person uh, leaves uh, the house open uh, and seven worse demons come in. If uh, you ask this question, you never... Um, that's not about you, because people who curse the Holy Spirit, they're not concerned with um, this kind of sin. Those people do evil. Um, that's their uh, situation. We, of course, each of us does evil, but Holy Spirit um, rebukes us to bring us to repentance. So we have confession, we have prayer of repentance and renewal. Jesus explains what, when that happened. Mark is telling us about this, Mark and Luke. There was a specific situation when Jesus commi uh, does a miracle and people say that he has a demon in himself. When you see one thing and you say the opposite thing, that's how, um, well, that's when your heart is of stone, like Father Miroslav said. At... Uh, um, our liturgy, we have uh, this prayer, send the Holy Spirit and transform uh, these gifts of communion. So the priest uh, calls for the Holy Spirit and says, this is uh, the blood of Jesus, the, uh, the body of Jesus to bread and wine. So the Lord borrows my mouth to my hands to announce uh, the call for the Holy Spirit and the Lord speaks through me. So you cannot say that you uh, acquire the Holy Spirit at that moment. At the Old Testament, there was understanding. If you say something against God, that's it. You will die immediately. You can see that in the book of Job when uh, his wife said, just curse God and die. They expected uh, to get... Uh, lightning and uh, thunder. Actually, the word there is not uh, to curse, it's to bless. It, this even phrase uh, um, was transformed, but it, was, it meant, like you said, there is another important thing about the Holy Spirit. You use this concept, acquire. Apostle, use the word, be filled with the Holy Spirit. How does it happen? In what way Christian can be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I can say from my side that there are many ways. The first way is opening the scripture. The, the word of God that is written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all scripture was uh, breathed in by God. Holy Spirit breathed in the man who wrote. When you study these holy texts, this is a process when Christian interacts with Holy Spirit. You cannot even understand the Word of God properly if Holy Spirit does not help you explain. And we read in the Gospel of John that Holy Spirit will remind you of everything. Holy Spirit is the one who is assisting me to read the Scripture or assists me to listen to uh, the Word of God when divine words are announced from the pulpit or read from the gospel. This is one of the ways, but there are many others. We uh, read also from St. John when he talks about uh, the supper, the supper of Christ or the uh, priestly uh, prayer of Jesus. He goes deeply into this issue. When I read those texts, Holy Spirit will come upon you, the spirit of righteousness, spirit of truth. When I live in truth and righteousness, he will be with me. I will be opening for him. Uh, 
my heart. I live in expectation of him. Um, he is near, but sometimes I don't invite him because he loves the truth. Uh, St. John uh, tells us, as he repeats uh, the word of Jesus, that's amazing. There are also texts in the scripture that the Spirit breathes where he wants. Uh, we can ask, but um, whether he comes or not is his thing. I uh, remember an another quote from Siluana Fonsky, that's another saint of um, 20th century. What he describes his state when Holy Spirit touched him. That's love to everyone, to sinners, to everyone. And then when this gift moves away, person is really sad, uh, longing for that atmosphere. And God just allows person to feel how it is to know that it's real. But you cannot uh, just uh, order that to come. It's uh, oh, like um, oh, this um, holy fire is coming. It comes so when God gives it, not at a certain hour when we expect it. Holy Spirit uh, will um, purify us because the clean uh, will not come to unpure. The text of liturgy explains the coming of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit does everything. He teaches uh, illiterate. He makes um, simple people into prophets or fishermen into apostles. In 17th century, after French Revolution, there was Jean Vianney. That's a saint priest. He was pastor uh, from Ars. He is um, um, patron of priests in Catholic Church, when we read his biography, he really had a um, hard time uh, with uh, science. And uh, he, he actually uh, was uh, blessed to be a seminarian and a priest uh, with um, uh, much grace and expectation. But with all his life, he preached Christ. Many people would come to his confession in simple village of France. After French Revolution, illiterate priest was doing great things. He was select vessel, like Apostle Paul, elect vessel. And uh, Holy Father said that he is uh, the patron of all Catholic priests. I experienced the action uh, of the Holy Spirit in this um, uh, century. Um, I, 15 years ago, I was uh, teaching to young men at uh, Bible Institute. They would come to European for one year, and they were making first steps in faith. We would take men who nobody would take, no seminary, because we uh, needed to help uh, them develop their spiritual life. I remember third or fourth week, and I asked one after lunch or maybe closer to evening, how do you like this day? And he said, um, you, didn't, you wouldn't believe I read more uh, today than um, uh, the rest of my life. They were not keeping him in each grade uh, longer than uh, necessary because they wanted to kick him out of school. Uh, he has not read a single book in nine grades. And that one day he read more pages than any than the rest of his life. But by the end of studies, he was reading by himself. He started talking about things he read. He started formulating his thoughts. He had this desire to learn. And now he is minister in the church. And I have experienced that more than uh, I have experienced that more than once when uh, Holy Spirit inspired new life into. Uh, these men, and uh, he inspired them to learn more and more by themselves, and they became great ministers even until today. I have this question. We are talking about the Holy Spirit, about importance of celebration, when we remember the events of the coming of the Holy Spirit, and we focus on 
demonstration of the Holy Spirit and how to be filled with Holy Spirit as we talk. But my question is, do all people have the Holy Spirit this moment that we mentioned already uh, the story with uh, Nicodemus when Jesus was saying that you need to be born from the Holy Spirit. I know there are different traditions. This birth from the Spirit, explain how your church teaches. Greek Catholic Church, during this um, sacrament of anointing with a uh, mirror uh, and uh, baptism, in Roman Catholic Church, that would be separate. Uh, is for baptism, and uh, after some time, a person has this uh, sacrament of confirmation. This uh, sacrament of anointing with myrrh is done by the priest in Orthodox and Greek Catholic Church. In Roman Catholic Church is done by the bishop. Baptist churches preach that Holy Spirit comes down as a result when the person believes in Jesus and confesses his uh, sins. The person believes in Jesus as a savior and uh, recognizes him as a God. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, you understand that you were unworthy and you lived very far from him. At this moment, when you repent sincerely, you recognize him as God, that's the moment that the Holy Spirit is leading you to, and Holy Spirit fills you with uh, this truth. And all ministers confirm that we don't know at which moment Holy Spirit truly fills the person. There are many testimonies of uh, uh, revived Christians who uh, witnessed that some people um, uh, get this during baptism. Uh, in some churches, uh, pa pastors lay their hands over people during repentance and they ask Holy Spirit to come down to this person. Uh, actually, for some people, it was a moment during the uh, prayer one-on-one uh, -on -one with God, and this was the life-changing experience for them. And uh, sometimes uh, this is the period of a lifetime. It's a process, and the person doesn't know when exactly this has happened. But all the people who went through the touch, who experienced the touch of the Holy Spirit, they can all say for sure that there was the change that occurred in the life of this person. Relatives noticed this change. The person noticed this change. This change. And um, when Peter preached, uh, and uh, they asked uh, Jesus, what shall we do? Oh, you need to confess your sins. Apostles baptized people when they believed and publicly recognized this fact. Uh, there is a, a beginning and then it's an endless process. So the person lived without God, with his own philosophy, acts, and then there was a meeting with God and the person repents and then the new life begins. Or this can be a process, re-evaluation. Maybe as we look uh, at the fresco of the uh, Italian artist, uh, how God uh, looks at Adam. Um, it's a Michelangelo, very famous um, fresco. In our tradition, in uh, Catholic and Orthodox tradition, we understand that Holy Spirit comes to us when we uh, uh, do the sacraments. And we have some deviations. I know that Orthodox Church and uh, our and your church, you have different opinions to this uh, on appointing with myrrh, but Holy Spirit, He is waiting for our invitation. He's waiting. He's there. He's among us. He is among us here. And He's waiting. He wants us to live in righteousness. And when you live in righteousness, He comes to you. When you open up to Him, when you confess your sins, He comes to you. When you... Uh, uh, do everything right, you get married, you do it all properly, He fills you with the Holy Spirit. But there's a problem that we can just not let Him in. We can let Him escape. Or if there is a sin, oh, it's the sin, and then Holy Spirit leaves, 
abundance? Well, if you worship the evil, what is, what is sin? Sin is evil. You, we can explain this from different points of view, from the standpoint of Orthodox Church, Catholic Church, but evil is sin. When you invite evil in your heart, you invite the demon, then you don't give the space to the Holy Spirit. And he abandons, he leaves you. He goes beyond you. You, you open the door, you say, come in, and he comes in. Actually, Apostle Paul describes in two words how Christian person, what he Christian person can do with the Holy Spirit. He can upset the Holy Spirit. Sin is when you upset the Holy Spirit and he cannot uh, express himself in this person. The second uh, is uh, second word is when you put like a bucket of water, you pour put over the fire you completely uh, just uh, uh, like pour water with your busyness, with your uh, vanity, with materialistic priorities. You just don't let that fire inside of you to burn. I remember I uh, read Dominique Bertanolomeo and uh, his theological work on the Holy Spirit and he says that evil is not when you ignore. The Holy Spirit is talking to the person and he encourages the person towards the righteousness, towards the righteous life. But the evil is not when you ignore these thoughts, these uh, thoughts, these ideas, but you make him be silent. So you completely, uh, you oppress, you oppose this internal voice inside of you. This is scary, actually. And in our church, we think, we've been thinking about the topic of freedom, choice. The person has the choice. And just recently, in our liturgies, we read such words. Uh, Saint Paul said, we all have to use this opportunity to accept the light of the Holy Spirit. He worded it very nicely, that the light of the faith uh, of the Holy Spirit. And truly, when the person lives in righteousness, in justice, in love, etc. When the person lives with these features, then the Holy Spirit is there. Dear fathers, dear pastor, we've been uh, having communi uh, fellowship for more than an hour, and I think our time is coming to the end. But dear friends, if you have questions and if you want to write down your questions, please share them with us. What uh, maybe briefly, can you give your last message? How can people get ready for the holidays that we are entering right now, that we will be celebrating? Maybe small recommendations, please. Actually, we're not talking about green uh, branches, right? By the way, I always liked the word they call uh, Pentecostal churches and uh, they also call green uh, branches uh, church. So there is a special tradition in the church when they put on the green clothes. Why green color? Because it represents life. And they bring, uh, actually, uh, our environmental, it's, it's against environment to cut all these branches. Uh, it's um, special green branches. Actually, in the western part of Ukraine, they're using a different kind of tree. Some people cut birch uh, tree branches. I don't like that. In some churches, you come in and there's mint branches. Uh, but 
it's a, it can be a distraction from the main point. Relationships with God, this is the most important thing that we all should be focused on. We should understand that he is a God, a one God in three persons, God's Son, a God, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are creator, savior, and uh, they sanctify us. We just need to realize uh, uh, who is who. Some people say that Trinity is God, uh, um, Nikolai, St. Nicholas. Uh, no, you just have to know very well the foundation of your faith, what you believe in. So speaking about the dissension of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Day of Ascension in Roman Catholic Temple, we uh, want to encourage people to think about the one who gives us the Holy Spirit and let us go into the depth of the mystery of what the Lord God has done for us, especially in this process of Easter, of this uh, transformation of us from the darkness of Egypt, from the slavery of Egypt, and to the land of freedom when we can freely praise our Lord God. There is a question here. Someone uh, wrote, good evening, I would like to ask, why Greek Catholic Church, as he talk about, talks about, uh, why he uses the word church for uh, Greek Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic, and uh, and uh, um, uh, Orthodox Church? Why you say church and then Protestant churches you call communities? Actually, I don't know why we call it this way. We say Protestant communities. Uh, all Ukrainian council of churches and religious organizations. Actually, in this, we should be thankful to this council because they appealed uh, uh, to the cabinet of ministers uh, with a petition to weaken up the quarantine. And when we enter deeper into the word of church, this is community, church is community as well. So Orthodox community, Protestant church, these are all good definitions, good words to use. There's not a mistake there when we use these words. Because temple is not just walls. The church is not walls. It's a very broad uh, meaning. See, in uh, such simplicity, you can write your words and we will voice them out. There was a German uh, theologian, Pauntiel, and as he was talking about Holy Spirit, he mentioned that Christian uh, who wants to be filled uh, with the Holy Spirit, he needs to walk through the corridors of the Spirit. Actually, cor we know what corridor is. It's something that com uh, unites two rooms together. So first corridor is prayer. It's conversation with God. And this is the moment that Christian person cannot understand because in prayer, we don't just talk, but we listen as well. And when we listen, we open up the Holy Scripture. This is the second corridor that Christian person should use. You read the Scripture of Old Testament and New Testament. And on these pages, you see the heroes of men and women who, to who God spoke. Second, uh, th uh, third is the church and community. These are people who honor God. They need to be in fellowship. The fourth is the testimony about Jesus. When you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, yes, you pray, yes, you scripture, yes, church, community, and of course, you need to speak out about your faith. You cannot be silent. And at this time, when you share about your faith, when the Holy Spirit fills you up. He fills you up in a special way. I wish that to myself and to you. At the time of the Holy uh, uh, Pentecost, we'll open up the hearts 
our hearts to the Holy Spirit, and may Holy Spirit will fill our bodies and our hearts. Uh, because when we read this prior, our, um, our heavenly uh, King, uh, who are giving us all the gifts, uh, come into our lives and save our souls, or kind one. This gift of Pentecost um, uh, that uh, we need to celebrate it worthily. Let's not quench the Holy Spirit that we have received at the uh, sacrament of baptism and anointing with myrrh. May Holy Spirit fill us all the time. May this joy flow from my heart as a spring of water that will never stop. Because sometimes we want to limit the Holy Spirit, but we cannot limit him. We cannot close him up to say, he's mine, but not my neighbor's. This Holy Spirit, in truth, may uh, he blaze come out of my heart to give joy of the Holy Spirit. And may we all give uh, uh, have this experience of the day of Pentecost to the right and to the uh, left. Thank you, Holy Fathers and Pastor, for your sincere answers and your good wishes. Thank you, friends, for watching us, following our discussion, writing your questions. I wish from me, as the Word of God spe speaks, not to quench, not to bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit, but be filled with Holy Spirit and walk in Him. May God bless you, and goodbye. Amen.